Welcome to the Burn Talk Show, the ADB Network's original YouTube series where we interview some of the most interesting people from the world of bourbon. Today on the show, we'll be talking to Lisa Wicker of Widow Jane and Heather Bean of Syntax Spirits. My name is McNew. Please join me in welcoming my co-host, Steve Aikley. Hey gang, what's up? How you guys doing? Hello. We are going to have a fun show today. We've got uh, a couple of great guests, two really good friends here with uh, Lisa and Heather. Should be really fun to talk to them. And hopefully uh, you guys will get to know them uh, better as well. Uh, we'll get to them in just a second. McNew and I always like to kick things off by talking about what's going on in the world of bourbon. So here are three big stories. Here's what's happening right now in the world of bourbon. So the owners of Louisville Slugger, and uh, you know, they are opening, and I guess it's open now, a separate bourbon experience uh, right next to the museum called Barrels and Billets. And uh, uh, Melanie sent us a photo. Or a photo. <laughs> she sent us the info on that today, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it sounds interesting. I, I wonder if this is going to become a huge thing with this you know, blending, uh, you know, you have different types of whiskey, just individual. And then, then you come in as a customer, you try to create your own blend. And then of course they then bottle for you the, you know, a single bottle. So I bet you that's going to be something that just starts taking off. Cause it seems to be more people are doing that at distilleries. Now you got businesses dedicated just to that. So it's very interesting, isn't it? it? It just adds to your whole experience. I think like, you know, you take a trip or a weekend trip, whatever. And it's like, Hey, I brought back this bottle. I blended it myself. Like it's just another memory to bring home. And I think that's very cool. It is. It definitely adds to it. You know, if you've got friends and uh, yeah, that, this is, a, I created this and, and um, I'll, unless I tell you what it is, you can't, you can't go back and create it yourself. It's a one of a kind, but. Exactly. You know, and like Louisville Slugger getting involved in the bourbon scene just makes sense. And I'm surprised they haven't done it yet. So that's very cool. Yeah. And kind of that area down there, you know, Whiskey Row and all that with the museums and all the distilleries and all the restaurants. That's just getting to be better and better and better that area. So, it is. Yeah. Cool. I think you're going to need more than a weekend to spend there now. Like you could do like a whole week. On, uh, right. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's cool. Uh, this next one, McNew, you're not going to be a fan of this one. Lost Ash Ridge Farm in Waddy, Kentucky, unveiled a Southern sweet Kentucky bourbon flavored breakfast sausage. So this would not be your thing. Uh, McNew, no, you're not I, I'm to... not into the sausage at all, but I... It, it also makes sense though. Like what isn't bourbon flavored these days? So just jump on that bandwagon. <laughs> it sounds good to me. I would, I would definitely want to try this. Would, this would is... you pass up your gas station sandwiches for this breakfast sausage? Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I would, <laughs> I would go out of my way to try this. So if there's a restaurant that's uh, carrying this, uh, you know, let us know and uh, I'll definitely come there and enjoy breakfast and, and give it a try. And yeah, if it's good enough, I may you know start picking some up and mulling it back when I'm in Kentucky. So so yeah. I know this isn't what it is, but I'm picturing like a McGriddle, like where instead of syrup, bourbon just pours out of it. <laughs> and I know that's not what it is, but that's what my head went Maybe to. that'll be a new thing. That's not a, that's not bad. Yeah. yeah. Definitely some, uh, you know, yeah. it's, you, know, you get that sausage and, and putting a little syrup on there. So some barrel, barrel aged syrup. Certainly Maybe, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. The uh, last third and final story. 2021 saw a record 340,000 guests come through the Buffalo Trace Distillery, which is notable because they surpassed their pre-pandemic 2019 levels by 16%. Amazing. And not surprised people are ready to get back out there. They were ready to see things and Buffalo Trace did everything right. So good for them. Yeah, they have the expanded visitor center and all that kind of stuff. So they were kind of set up just by chance. And uh, of course they had it, you know, where it's all separate to the tasting areas, which was all, you know, open before and then they, they closed it. So it was just, everything kind of worked out just well for them. And they do a great job anyway. They have all the different types of tours and experiences. So yes. uh, yeah, nothing but good things to say about what they got going there. And, and certainly the numbers support the things that they're doing. So very cool. Very yes. cool. All right. Well, that is what is going on in the world of bourbon. It's now time to talk to our guests. So our first guest is one of the most respected distillers from the world of bourbon. Absolutely. Uh, she is not only Helm's Widow Jane brand, but uh, her consulting work means she's helped out numerous distilleries with their products. Please join me in welcoming Lisa Wicker. Hey, Lisa, how's it going? Hey, Steve. It's good to see everyone. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you Absolutely. for the invitation too. I appreciate it very much. Oh, we love having you on. So it's uh, always a pleasure to talk to you. 
So we always like to kick it off by kind of getting to know you a little bit on a personal basis, something we've never asked you before, that type of thing. So here's what I got for you. And I, I don't know, I'm just taking a chance at this. I have no idea if this even applies to you, but what sort of gambling do you like to do if you're going to gamble? I'm not saying you have, you do a lot, but if you ever, what something that you enjoy, and it could be table games and casinos, slot machines, sports betting, squares on a board at a, you know, Super Bowl party, that type of thing. Or, you know, what, like what I like, I like playing poker, anything like that. What, what, what would you like if you had to choose your favorite way of gambling, if you gamble at all? Well, the last five years, because of being in, being in New York, you know, to get my little dose of Kentucky, there's an app called Twin Spires and I okay. bet on horses on Twin Spires. Ah, <laughs> nice. Like the horses. Okay. Watching the ponies. Yeah. Yeah. I've been doing okay. You know, I've got a balance close to $500. I've won, I think in there. Whoa. <laughs> Hello. So yeah, that's not bad. How much now? Yeah, it's not bad at all. I download that app every May for the Derby and then I delete it immediately because I know I will get in trouble. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've had to delete it on myself before. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. have you ever had one that was just like, what, what's, what's the story of, of the best one that you ever hit? Is there something um, like a long it, shot one time that, that came the in? Derby or? Before, and you're going to ask me the horse's name and I'm going to be embarrassed to not tell you. I tell you, you can make it up. Cause I don't know. So <laughs> I, I, pick, I pick horses because they'll like, if there's like Brooklyn is part of the name now or uh -huh. something, you know, like, you know, it's like, Oh, well that reminds me of, you know, what, anyway, so that's how I pick horses. That, or you know, you have taken my grandsons to Keeneland, and you know, we pick because that's those silks are prettier than those silks, you know. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So you just have fun with it. Yeah, it's yeah, not a serious exactly. thing. You just have some fun. Yeah. yeah. But I, I just shocked everyone because I, you know, I bet on the long shot that it ended up winning. Right. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. Very very cool. All right people in my family are like you know because i'm still a transplant right you know i've been there for several years now but my daughter married into a kentucky family and they're all like what you know? <laughs> yeah they're looking to you now for for advice and you're I, just like, oh. I like the name and I yeah. <laughs> yep nothing wrong with that for sure uh, yeah, and you probably have as good a luck as, as about anybody because you know that there is so so many factors that go into that horse racing so yeah that's not a bad bad way to go as long as you're having fun Lisa, before we get into your career, we, we have to start out with this because it's been such big news. Obviously, Widow Jane uh, being bought out by Heaven Hill. Give us a little update where we're at on that and, and what do you think is going to happen uh, with the company kind of moving forward? Right now, we are, you know, I, I, we're, you know, we're meeting with Heaven Hill and moving forward on different things. But the interesting thing that happened with this and the thing that surprised so many people is Samson and Surrey, our parent, the company that originally bought Widow Jane five years ago yeah. um, is still intact. I still have the same boss. Um, okay. I, you, we still have the same organizational structure and, you know, pretty much it's going to be hands off, except for the fact that we're going to have more support services. Right. And, yeah. be able to, you know, we've had such phenomenal growth over the last three years um, that we'll be able to have a, um, you know, somebody to help shore us up a little bit. So yeah, I can't wait. I'm so excited. It's so much fun. Um, you know, you're on, I'm on these meetings with people that are, you know, a mile from my house. Oh, I probably not, shouldn't say where my house is in Bardstown. <laughs> I, I, I got a text message one day and these guys had figure out where I lived and I was in Brooklyn and they're all on my front porch taking, you know, pictures. No, <laughs> people, someone would do that. Yeah. Ugh. Never dreamed in a million years, but yes, they did. Yeah. And, um, so, Have them show up to Mr. Bill's house. Uh, that'd be the one and only time they did that. Let me tell you. Another time I told my daughter, like, I'm a caller. I'm like, you have got to run down the street and take my widow Jane sticker off my truck. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm like, I don't have time to explain. Just go take the widow Jane sticker off my truck. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's crazy. Um, yeah. So it, uh, like I said, I, you know, we had that little, you know, pre-interview interview and of all the companies, the kicking our tires i didn't know who else, anyone else you know i didn't know anybody else by name i didn't knew that that was happening but um heaven hell was just a dream come true it yeah um, you know so much respect for the program and so much respect for the family and um it, you know the products speak for themselves right and um yeah and from a selfish standpoint it's you know literally down the street for me so 
Yeah. Yeah. How great is that? So yeah, great company. And yeah, hopefully, like I said, they just, you know, they bought you because they like you, they like what you're doing. So the best thing they can do is kind of be hands off, but give you some of that support behind the scene, whether it's marketing or whatever, whatever you need to, to make the brand even bigger. I think that's, that's very cool. So yeah, I, I like, I, I like what's, what's going on there. Yeah. My, I was my boss's cover too in Kentucky, right. When they were showing up in Kentucky, right. And they didn't tell me what they were doing, but just after picking them up and I pick them up in my truck, and they got suits on. I've worked for them for five, almost five years. And I'm like, I've never seen them in a suit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> yeah like, about, he's taking the suit jacket on me. He's in the back seat of my truck. He's like smoothing it all out. I'm like, okay. <laughs> right. Right. Let's talk. And we had a side trip. I mean, we ran down to, to Castle and Key, you know, because one of my bosses had never been there. And you know, the other one meets me there often when I'm running barrels there. But um yeah, you know, and we're out for this outing and then I have to take them back to Louisville, right? And drop them off. And it's like something, yeah. So I tell them they come here and they're telling me that, you know, that the Heaven Hill people are coming to visit and they, cause they flew in and take me to dinner. I said, first, before I, I'm trying to try not to cuss tonight. I said, first, before- Oh, you can cuss, <laughs> feel free, be yourself. Before you tell me anything, I said, you guys are terrible liars and I don't know what's up, but this is what I suspect. And um, one of my bosses just handed me the wine list. He's here, like here. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. So it's nice. been a wild ride. It's been so much. It's been fun getting to know them and um, keeping the secret from my family. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that, that's that's that stuff. I really didn't tell anyone. Right. And yeah. And so my daughter and I, the Friday before the announcement was on a Tuesday, um, I, I was back in Kentucky and I said, I, I sent her a message. I said, you know what, I'm going to scratch a couple of my meetings and um, let's go over to the new Heaven Hill visitors experience. Cause she and I kept saying we were going to do that even before, you know, all this happened. And she's like, yeah. So we go over there and I buy all these bottles, which is an unusual, right. And um, it's 1130, 11 o'clock in the morning. And and I'm like, let's, you know, let's go get a drink. She said, sure. And then we ended up buying some flights, right. And, and getting through all of that. And then I had lunch with a podcaster and he'd picked up a couple more podcasters. And so I told her she's very, not, she's also entrenched in the bourbon industry and very knowledgeable. And so I said, why don't you just join us for lunch? Right. And, and um, yeah, so we went through all of that, you know, and I called them about a half hour before the press release was going to drop. And for those of you that some people know this about me and some people don't. My son-in-law was the executive chef for my Maker's Mark for five years and he still works with the Samuels family because um, <clears throat> they had a five-year contract on the Star Hill pro project and are back out on their own. But my son-in-law was with Rob Samuels and Jane Bowie and the like the Maker's Mark legal team that night. My daughter's like, can I tell him? I'm, she's like, he's like with, I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. So I call her back just a few, like 10 minutes later, like it dropped. It just dropped. You can tell him, you can call him and tell him, but. Oh, nice. <laughs> so Lisa, you know, as you look into the crystal ball and of course we, I always say that the, the beer industry is wow. ahead of the bourbon industry. It's a little bit more mature. So you see what's happening with craft beer. And now we're starting to see, you know, some of the things happen in craft bourbon, like we saw in craft beer, you know, acquisitions. Do you think this is just kind of the start or are we going to see more of the, the bigger distilleries picking up some of the smaller distilleries like we've seen in the beer industry? You know, Steve, you probably have a better idea than I do. I mean, mm -hmm. really, you know, uh, from all, all of your programming and everything, I really don't know. I think, I think you're exactly right. I think that the big guys, it's really interesting when you're watching beer, I was still making wine at the time, you know, when the craft brewery started getting bought up and, you know, everybody just ignored, they, the big guys ignored the craft programs completely. They didn't change their product line. They just stayed the course. And then all of a sudden craft beer had 11% market share right and everybody woke up yeah <laughs> right? yeah and yeah so it's not even so much i think market share it's just about i think the bourbon industry is so driven by um innovation right now the whiskey industry in general is um the spirits industry absolutely it is um and you know i think that tapping into that um you, you know i think is probably something that the a lot of people are interested in uh, it's a way to pick up some other brands and product lines that you know are already established so somebody else has already taken that first risk right you know? yeah it's, it's, it's not that it's not a risk buying a craft distillery but you know it's already been if you've got you know a proven track record and growth and everything they already know that you've kind of gotten 
you know, tried out a little bit. Yeah, so, it's a known entity. So yeah, yeah. for sure. But I think you can answer that probably better than I can. What do you think? Yeah, I definitely think that's going to be the case. I, I, I think that, uh, you know, um, and, and again, you think about the, the large distilleries, are they are they doing anything that's unique or are they doing things that craft distilleries have already done, even with their, their current product lineups? It seems like they're just letting the craft vet things out, whether that's different heirloom grains or different processes, and then they're, they're doing them. So I think it makes sense for them to get into that business. I hope that they take that hands-off approach like you're talking about going on with Heaven Hill. I think that's important to let them retain their own identity. Uh, you know, we don't want, you don't want to have big heritage craft or big heritage distillery and then little mini versions of that. You want them to be different and bring to the table what they've always brought. So hopefully if that happens, I think it'll be a healthy bourbon industry for a long time, but we'll see. Uh, I, I definitely think there'll be more acquisitions emerges because yeah, it just makes sense. It's a, it's a way to, for, um, the, you know, these distilleries to diversify and to continue growth and, and make sure that their fingers on the pulse. So it's, it's a thing that I, I definitely think we'll see more of. Um, give us a little bit of your career overview because you have such a fun career and uh, oh are we drinking? I know. We're, we're drinking. Sure. Sure. We're, we're having a drink. So we're just sitting back. Oh. With the, yeah, absolutely. Everybody's got a drink there. So. Okay. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> You don't want to share your career path, all the stuff you've done. Okay, oh, you don't have I'm to. Tell you my career path. Um, you know, my kids have said to me before, like, you've got to figure out a way to like tell this because it's, you know, it's just a, it's a crazy, crazy road, right? Um, right. A little unconventional. Um. I, yeah, you know, I I started out as a commercial winemaker. I'd been working in the arts for years. I had founded and was running a, a costume company for a professional dance company in a kind of an underserved arts area and did that for six years. Um, you know, we'd moved all over. My kid's dad is in manufacturing and and we settled in um, back in Indiana where we both grew up, not the same city um, and spent, you know, the next few years raising our kids there. And I kind of fell into that job. I was doing some other technical writing and things. And, and then um, uh, some, this is so crazy. Some kindergarten moms of my youngest, when my youngest was in kindergarten said, we, they'd been working in this tasting room at Simmons Winery and outside of Columbus, Indiana. And they said, we are short people to harvest grapes. Do you want to harvest grapes? I'm like, sure. <laughs> This is the start of it, the harvesting grapes, huh? Yeah. 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 Because they could not find any farm labor, right? And right. so we had the best time. But then I find myself costuming a nut, full nutcracker, um, costuming a nutcracker for another camp company and harvesting grapes. It was <laughs> yeah. quite the fall. And um, years ago, years and years ago, I, you know, one of the my friends growing up, his parents owned a winery in Bloomington, Indiana, Oliver Winery. And they, I was in their home when all the farm winery laws were getting passed, right? And so I, back then I got my head around the idea somebody could actually make wine, you know, for a living. They, it was started out as his father's um, advocation and, you know, his dad got all the laws passed because there were no Sunday sales in Indiana. And it was the best kept secret for years that you could purchase wine you know, on Sundays in Indiana after all those laws got passed. And so that, you know, was kind of the initial um, kick for the Indiana wine industry. So I had that, that piece, you know, way back when. And so we get done with Simmons, um, uh, the, one of the former winemakers from there got, got wind that, you know, that I was working at Simmons. And so he'd asked me every time I was in there, when are you going to come to work for me? And he actually called me this time. He's like, I want you to come in. I want to talk to you about something. And I go in and he's like, I just, you know, I want you to come to work for me. And I asked him later, I'm like, what made you, you know, he goes, because he and I'd worked together years before at the Department of Natural Resources on the maintenance crew. And I was, that was my summer job in high school and college. And he's like, I knew you didn't mind getting dirty. I knew you didn't mind working hard. And, um, you know, I, so anyway, he said, I, you just kept crossing my mind when I was thinking about, you know, people that needed to, you know, that I wanted to work with. And so, um, yeah, three days in, I knew that's what I was supposed to be doing. I was ended up on the production crew with him and his son, son um, his oldest of two sons and myself, and spent the next eight years there, um, you know, apprenticing him, um, educating myself anywhere I could at, you know, any kind of extension programs with Purdue or Virginia Tech or 
um, and then started saving my money and going out to University of California Davis and wow. uh, their intensives to for fermentation and um, and and filtration and anything I could, you know, but scraping my pennies together and, um, you know, maybe sleeping an occasional night in my rental car, right, to make ends meet. And, and it just all made sense to me. I mean, I don't know why it all made so much sense. And so um, after my, my youngest was graduating from high school and the people, some people we were buying grapes from, they had a 10-year-old established vineyard in Kentucky, um, said to my boss, you, um, we're, we're not gonna have grapes for you next year and we're going to build a winery and he said you need to hire Lisa as your consultant just out of the blue we'd never discussed it he said you need to hire Lisa as your consultant she's ready and so I started consulting in Lebanon Kentucky and um, they offered me the position the winemaker position there so I moved the week that my youngest daughter um, went off to college and haven't looked back it was 11 years ago and it's been a crazy ride so I meet Steve Beam out of the gate like just six weeks after I'm down there, he is literally down the road from me. Uh -huh. um, each other's extra set of hands in the evenings. And oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. You know, I had a background in fermentation, so I was able to help out there, you know, when they run into some troubles and things. And so, um, and he helped me, oh my gosh, some crazy stuff. I mean, bitter cold, the TTB, I had to transfer, I had to move all this wine from one facility to the other. And um, God bless him, he was in there with me. <laughs> <laughs> all this wine because the TTV only gave me 48 hours to get it all moved. So, um, yeah, so we did, all, you know, and then the winery owners went through a real spectacular divorce and I saw the writing on the wall because that unfortunately it happens in the wine industry. Once a divorce happens, wineries tend to go out of business. And so, um, I saw the right writing on the wall, booked a ticket to Sonoma. I thought, well, I'm going to have to go to Sonoma and work a harvest and live in a campground or something. And, and, um, Paul and Steve Beam took me to dinner 24 hours after I resigned the winery and um, offered me a full-time job at Limestone Branch. Nice. Very yeah. Cool. And I'd already, I'd wanted to learn to distill. I got my, wiggled my way on the legislative committee um, in Kentucky because at that time, no, you know, you, I, you know, you couldn't have a still because I was thinking of me making brandy. Right. And, um, you know, never had to get that far down the road, but I was making brandy bases for Steve. You know, I was, I was fermenting fruit and things for him um, for some client work that he was doing and we were transferring it down to the distillery and running it, you know, Steve, yeah. so you get a couple of phone calls from me. It's like, what, what are you doing? This because this stuff stinks. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, just finished distilling it. It was delicious. It was cherry. It was actually cherry brandy, but um yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that's how we got started and that's how I got started. And then I was with Limestone Branch under three years and Lexco purchased them. And I got fired and I was, you know, the number two guy. Right. And so right. I got let go and immediately had an offer in South Carolina um, and passed, I, I passed on it, but then they countered with consulting. And so I was going back and forth to South Carolina and then um, another really amazingly wonderful craft distillery. Um, ended up calling me because they found out that I was, you know, looking for more permanent work in Kentucky. And I was just stunned that they called, but, you know, craft distilling was just exploding. Right. And yeah. so they gave me an offer and I was getting ready to accept it. And Ted Huber calls me and I'd known Ted for years because of winemaking. And um, I didn't know he'd added a grain distillery. And he said, Lisa, don't accept that until I, um, you know, you can talk to me and I was going to accept the offer on a Friday. I'm like, well, I'm going to accept it on a Friday. He said, let's talk on Thursday. There's a snowstorm. Right. So he's like, J just please put them off until, you know, Dana and I can talk to you on Sunday. And he knocked the other offer out of the park, not just monetarily, but with what I was going to be able to do there. Yeah. And sure enough, you know, so I stayed there for a year and a half, thought I'd stay there forever. Cause they are two of the nicest people that walk the face of the earth. And, um, Drew Colesveen, the master distiller for Will, that happened, his, his buddy, my son-in-law's, and he saw me at a family thingy and said, Lisa, I've been meaning to call you, if, you know, somebody we've been in business with on and off over the years, you know, um, is going to build the first craft distillery in Nelson County, Kentucky, and, um, you know, I think you're a good fit, and so I you know, went back and forth about whether I was going to accept it. My daughter said, the only reason you're thinking about not accepting this is because you don't want to tell Ted and Dana goodbye. <laughs> right. Okay. okay. You're accurate. All right. So, so yeah, so crazy stuff. So I go there for a year. Um, 
I was not the best match personality wise. And so I decided it was time for me to go out on my own. And um, I started Saints and Monsters Consulting, um, maybe named after my grandsons, but let's please not <laughs> <my> daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and so I went out on my own and I had two clients right away. And um, my third client was Samson and Zuri. Um, Robert Furness Rowe called me. Um, they found my name through the George Washington Project. I've been the senior consulting distiller there now for six years this month. Yeah, nice. Yeah, six years next week. And, and so because of the success we had there, you know, my name got tossed around a little bit and that's how he found me. But my boss used to run Bacardi internationally. He was president of Bacardi Asia and president of Bacardi North and South America and, and all, you know, all the things, right. And he's British and just a real charmer. And so anyway, I tell him no at first, cause he's like, I need somebody to move to New York city. I'm like, I am not cut out to live in New York city. <laughs> <laughs> Here I sit. Um, and, and so anyway, he counters with consulting again, right? He's like, well, let's just bring you on as a consultant. I agreed to that. But he, but he also, in the meantime too, he's like, I'm just three weeks later, he calls me because I've really got to talk to you. I'm going to fly up to Bardstown and take you to dinner. And we went to dinner and 10 minutes into dinner, I thought I'm going to go to work for this guy, right? Um, he's right. Like saying all the right things. He's telling me how much stock they're purchasing, how much stock they've already purchased, what the stock was. Did he mention and the exposed brick? Uh, <laughs> was that a selling point at any point during the thing yeah, there's a lot of exposed brick. yeah it was, it's great yeah it's just been crazy ride right and so then a year and a half later a year later they asked me to dismiss my other clients i came on as director of distilling for all of our brands in our portfolio there were five at the time not six and spent six months doing that but i didn't have time to spend time at any of the other distilleries i mean widow jane needed full attention and so um, he called me three and a half years ago and said, you know, he was president of Widow Jane. He said, I want to transfer my title to you. And, um, you know, I want you to move to New York and be president and head distiller. And I said, yes, because this project, there was just nothing. I've had other offers, you know, and there's just not a project that matches this project. I can't, there's something about it that I, you know, I have um, grown to love very much. And uh, my team is remarkable. I just, I put my team up against anybody in the industry. They, um, people come and find out what we're doing, how much growth we've had. And there's 15 of us total for wow. everything. Tours, running the bar. I have cross-trained everyone, even my bartenders. I've bought them steel-toed boots and they all are sort forklift certified. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's no, cause we just have, you know, one track after another. And if they, somebody else needs to hop on the forklift, everybody's good to go. Right. And um, because of that, when barrel, you know, barrel trucks come and everything, it's all hands on deck. We get the group text message and everybody hits the ground running. And, um, you know, we unload as fast as we can being in the city and Very that's how nice. we make it work. Yeah. yeah. To this day, you still do consulting work and stuff like that. So what, what would somebody come to you if they're, if they're, you know, what, what would, what kind of problems are they having where they'd say, Hey, Lisa, can you help me out with this? Yeah. I no longer do consulting work just because I don't have the time. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, it feels a little disloyal to my company. They've been so good to me. I do, of course, I'm, you know, I don't take pay at Mount Vernon, you know, I'm full, full, fully consulting that, you know, unpaid consultant there, but I w always answer phone calls you yeah. know, somebody calls and they're stuck or they're upset, or, you know, I've had people calling and near tears and can't get the conversions in their mash or, you know, or something like that. And I've been there, I've been there personally. So it's like, uh, you know, my mentor is a gentleman named Dave Sherrick and Dave is the gentleman that put Woodford Reserve back together, right? He's been at Seagram's and Wild Turkey and, and with Brown Foreman and he's in his seventies and he's still, you know, got his brands he's working with right and I told him I said I can never repay you and I know it sounds cliche but I said I promise I'll always pay it forward so yeah. uh, you know, if someone calls me and they're stuck or they need you know they need an introduction or um, some a lead on a piece of equipment or something like that you know I um, I've been there <laughs> Nice. I'm still there some days I have to, you know, some days I have to turn around and call those people. So, um, you know, it's, it, that's what I love so much about the distilling industry. The winemaking was fun. Winemakers were great. Um, but they didn't share like distillers do. There's just no secrets in distilling. And I love that very much, you know, early on my boss coming from rum, um, I was running all those barrels at Castle and Keeney's like, I don't know. I don't know, you know, how much we're going to share about running those barrels there. And I said, Robert, well, there's no secrets in whiskey. You know, I can keep my mouth shut. But, um, and we had nine women 
um, come into the distillery in Brooklyn and they're all from Kentucky. And they said, oh my gosh, we were, you know, they're get, they've got Broadway tickets and everything else. And they took time to come to the distillery, which I loved very much. And they, they said, we were at Castle and Key and we saw Widow Jane Barrels and we're like, what is that all about? It's in Brooklyn. And they saw the Brooklyn, on, you know, on our stencil. And, and so they looked us up, they came and took the tour. So I told my boss, I said, see. <laughs> yeah, look at that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, another, another person that we all know in the industry in Kentucky, he's got his cell phone down by his leg and he's taking a picture of the barrel head. He goes, you're going to talk to me about this, you know? <laughs> yes, I'm going to talk to you about no it. No secrets in this industry. Yeah. Yeah. This industry yeah. yeah. Well, uh, now it's an exciting time because it is now time for something we added just this season. It's the McNew question. So in the middle of the interview, McNew asked a question. <laughs> She's got to be excited about this, Elisa. And you can, you can, you can verify this. I've been trying to get you on, on here for a while. It just hasn't worked out. Uh, the, we had a whole thing of going back and forth and uh, McNew, but has been telling me from season one, we got to get Lisa Wicker. We got to get, and I'm like, yeah. I'm, friends with Lisa. <laughs> I'm friends with Lisa. It's just, you know, our schedules and, you know, uh, well, for a while. She knows, my, she knows my responses on her social media posts. I'm a fan of hers. So nice. yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. such a big fan of yours. And I'm like, Lisa commented on my thing. It makes my day every time. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. There you go. Here you go. Here's your mo moment, McDill. All right. I, and I feel like I should have came up with a better question, but it's a two-parter. What is your favorite part of New York? And what is your favorite part of Kentucky when you're oh living there? Oh, gosh. Um, it'd be a cop-out for me to say the people and the people. Um, yeah. Yeah. Can't say right. the people. That's a given. <laughs> um, New York, if you start breaking it down, is actually just a whole lot of villages stuck together. Mm-hmm. And I love that because so many neighborhoods still have such distinctive personalities. My neighborhood here, um, Italian American, right? And the best pizza place in all of New York City, which is not just my opinion, as a lots of people, is literally a five minute walk from my from my apartment. And um, yeah, you know, but like I said, you, there's too many there's too many to explore. There's a billboard in um, when you come into Brooklyn. It says if you eat in a different restaurant every day in Brooklyn, it's going to take you 19 years. That's wild. I believe it too, but that is wild to think about. Yeah. So I still love that there's so much, um, um, it's just not homogenized, you know, it doesn't look like the, you know, one of the crossroads, it's got the Home Depot and the Starbucks and, you know, where you see them all over the country it, things are, you know, the neighborhoods here are still um, a lot of mom and pop restaurants, mom and pop um, hardware stores, old time hard hardware stores. I love walking up to Court Street to me and, you know, you walk in and it's just, yeah, you know, old mom and pop places, right, that are still in business here. And I, I love that part. It reminds me of my childhood, you know. Um, Kentucky, oh my gosh, my heart. I am a transplant to Kentucky, but I, I swear I lived in Kentucky in a previous life, you know. I, <laughs> I, I love the culture. I love the fact that there's, you know, old, old horse money and bourbon and the moonshining culture and um, the music and the you know, the food and the terrain. And yeah, I love Kentucky. I love Kentucky. It's just, yeah. So it's the favorite part is all of it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, um, Kentucky just has, it does have that home feeling. Like when I cross over the river, I'm just like, oh, it feels nice. Even though I'm from Indiana, but Kentucky feels like a home too. Yeah. yeah you know, and I'm a Hoosier too by birth. Right. And yeah. same thing. Yeah. It just, it, it, it's just a remarkable place. I'm really, I'm hooked. <laughs> yeah. I love it too. And I've never lived in Kentucky at all. And yeah, but it does feel like home when you go there, people are just so nice and accepting. And, you know, uh, there's certainly plenty of uh, people that do what I do in Kentucky. And it's always nice that they welcome me just like I'm a native son there. It's, it's cool. So I, I really do. I really do like that place for sure. And it's sincere. Yeah. You know? it, it really is. is. And I'm just so surprised how, like I said, kind everyone is. And um, I mean, you know, there's good people and bad people everywhere right but you know over right you know i live on a dream street right i mean my neighbors are <laughs> just the best known entities yes for sure uh so distilling is very science forward there's artistry in distilling but that's it's science forward i would say but blending is again there's some science into blending but it's more artistry forward so tell us how you create the perfect blend because you certainly get to do a lot of that uh with widow jane so tell us about that well, today I did, we have a product called Decadence that we rebarrel and crown maples, uh, maple syrup barrels. And I did the base blend on it. And, you know, my thing with it is that the base blend has to be a standalone blend. It, right. 
not something I'm trying to cover up, but the balance on that one, I need a little bit more alcohol heat. I need a little bit more um, wood tannin and a little bit more oakiness. I actually need some barrels that are a little bit over extracted in that blend. So with something like that, like the, the, our flagship is the 10 year old and it's a five barrel small batch. Right. And I've done 600 batches. Of wow. Five barrel small batch. And so transferring that some of it has gotten to a place where it's muscle memory. Um, when we draw down barrels, you know, we're trying to, we don't just draw down. I don't cherry pick barrels because I need to be able to use all of all of our stock. And I don't want to get to the end, you know, not the end, but you know, where I don't have any barrels left. So, um, you know, when I'm, I'm sorting samples out, so like decadence is 18 to 21 barrels. And so I start sorting like it, it's um, Indiana, Kentucky, and Tennessee. So I'll just start sorting. I go and I just taste barrel after barrel. They bring me 50 mil samples. And so then I'll just start like putting them together. Like, okay, this one, I don't like the mid palate note on it. So here's all the ones I don't like the mid palate note. It's really, it's really pronounced and I'm not crazy about it. And then like, oh, here are all my cherry bombs over here, right? These are spectacular cherry bombs. Here's my, you know, my leather tobacco row. And then, um, you know, and I do that with each state, right? And depending on like Kentucky, I've got so many different Kentucky barrels, right, from different places, and and so those are sometimes my more my wild cards about what how I can balance the blends out by adding the Kentucky to that Indiana and Tennessee. And so like that's round one, right, going through all of them like that, and then I've got these clumps everywhere, right? And then round two is starting to divide out. Um, you know, what I need for the balance in it. Right. And then round three is me taking like, okay, like today I had six, six, it doesn't always work out this way, but I had six, um, Indiana, I had, um, six Tennessee and I had five Kentuckys. Um, and then I had another wild card in Indiana, um, that there's a whole long story behind it, but it's like, that's actually, I took a bunch of barrels and batted those. Um, and, so I have, you know, a different sample of it. And so then I take each one of those. So I've got my four cylinders and I'm taking each one of those then, and then tasting that to make sure that there's not a barrel that's throwing something out of balance. And if there is, then I only have to work with those six barrels to get those back into balance again. Right. And then yeah. after that, then I combine those two, I combine these two, and then I combine all four together. Um, you know, I cap it, I let it sit, I taste it against the current product, taste it against you know, um, some of our other product lines, sometimes I'll taste it against somebody else's whiskey, yeah. you know, because I don't want to get house palette either. You know, I want to make sure that, you know, we're still hitting the mark where we need to hit the mark. So, yeah. And I've got the best team in the whole world. And so, you know, they bring me gazillion samples and I can go back at, which I did and said, can you bring me like seven or eight more Kentuckys? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, the, and that's all. okay. Is the, is the toughest component of it known when it's done? Because it seems like you could forever just keep kind of reworking it and be like, well, a little of this, a little of that. It's, it, the, the toughest has to be like, no, we're not doing anything else. This is it. COVID taught me not to overthink. Okay. Um, yeah, with COVID, March 2020, um, I had to move a couple projects up. You know, my boss is like, you know, if we can get these on, um, you know, get these on the truck because you know, everything was falling apart. We didn't know what was going to happen, right? You know, if we can get these up and out and one of them was vaults and one of them was decadence, our um, maple syrup finish. And I had to stop overthinking it and put them together, right? Yeah. And so the decadence had already been barreled and the maple syrup barrels, it was ready to come out, but I was nervous about it. And, um, you know, it's like, I just got to do this thing. You just, I just need to have tunnel vision and it has to just be, you know, uh, I have to stop overthinking it and yeah we're great you know and guess what that vaults is my highest scoring whiskey i ever i've ever produced <laughs> nice congrats yeah, on that. That's was lovely. that was such a good bottle thank you yeah. yes i learned i learned the lesson the hard way right i mean so yeah you know but it's like oh okay all right you just have to hit that mark and not you know try to shake off i'm nervous at everything i've everything i've learned right even to jack and this this morning it's like people spend their hard earned money, you know, 11 years ago in this business, I was making less than minimum wage, right. And no benefits. So <laughs> it's like people have spent their hard earned money on this whiskey. And I don't want people to be disappointed. If they're disappointed, I want it just because it's not their cup of tea. I don't want it to be because they don't, they think the quality is not there or, you know, the, 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 you know, it's, it's just not, not 
what they wanted to pick, but they don't, you know, but they still saw some value in it. So, yeah. yeah. So when you do what you do, Lisa, are you always kind of experimenting for maybe future products down the road? And if so, is there any that you can talk about right now? Um, everything's always a work in progress. I'll tell you what happened is that some of it got pushed aside. I mean, I still, I'm always tinkering. Don't, I mean, today I had wood samples all over and somebody's like, you know, what are you doing? Like, oh, I'm trying to get these organized. And my steam team's looking at like, hey, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I got wood samples on top of my, you know, my cabinets and I got stuff underneath the cabinets and, and yeah, so, but we had no idea the brand would take off like it did. And so it's everything we can do for the innovation that we have done so far um, to keep on top of that. We grew 60% the year before last, and we've grown another 60% on top of that. Wow. So, yeah. The growth has been phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. That's been <laughs> but um, yeah, so it's, beyond our, you know, my personal wildest dreams is what's happened. But um, yeah, and you know, like I said, we're, and we're even working to improve the quality of what we have already. You know, when somebody comes back and you realize that, you know, a bad cork went into a bottle or, you know, something, something else is askew, you know, we're working really hard to, to, con you know, continuous improvement is kind of our thing, right? You know, it's like, okay, we did this really well, you know, what can we do better the next time? Yeah, um, yeah we really don't rest on that. Well, one more serious question before we get to the fun. We always end with the fun one, but uh, one more serious one. And, and I, it's something that's going on big time. And I've certainly heard from a lot of my craft story buddies that, uh, you know, the issue with barrels, uh, you know, there's definitely a barrel shortage going on right now and they're scrambling. What can we do? So, you know, what, what do you think the impact of this is going to be on the industry? That is the question of the day. Um, I mm -hmm. took my team. We, American Craft Spirits Association convention was in Louisville this year in December. And so some of my production team had never been, all of my production team had never been to Kentucky in a bourbon capacity before. And so, you know, we went on, I, we skipped out on workshops one day and I took them on this epic trip from, we started at Nord's Bakery in Louisville and ended up, um, you know, at Woodford Reserve after dark, you know, but we took them everywhere, Castle and Key. I took them to our cooperage. I took them by our farmer because we do grow corn in Kentucky, um, our heirloom corn, right, for our yep. baby tea that I'm laying down. And so I took them, but we went to Zach Cooperage and we were there probably an hour and a half or almost, they loved it, right? Well, maybe even two hours. And, and you know, so I ha was talking to Bruce for a while, but it's just, there's, it, I don't know. Yeah. You know, their costs have gone through the ceiling, their cost on the steel for hoops. And um, it, it's just, so it's not even just the wood shortage, right? Now there's a wood shortage and, um, you know, we're, pr we're protected. I have a good relationship with um, Bruce and Zach of Zach Cooperage and, um, you know, uh, they're going to, they'll do everything they can, but that doesn't mean that if they don't have trees, they, they can't get right. Barrels, right? Um, I don't know. I've, I've got a couple craft distillery forum things that I'm on, you know, that are kind of, you know, just memberships just open so you can have these kind of honest conversations. And I've got a couple of buddies that are well established, one on the West Coast, another one in the central part of the country. And they're like, can anybody spare 150 barrels? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it's like all the barrel, the cooperages, you call them and they're booked through 2022. They have right. they're completely booked. And, and, you know, I don't know if, if how much that plays into somebody because owning a distillery is because whiskey is so hot or American bourbon. The, the fact that uh, I think there's still a lot of people that want to get in the game. And, you know, I don't know that that's something that they think through right away is, am I going to have a hard time finding barrels? And they should, because it's, it's very tough right now. Well, and that's the reason cash flow product, you know, when people say, you know, about, Oh, well that distillery sources bourbon or that they only make moonshine. It's like, look, if you're starting out in craft distilling, there's like three business plans. You either source and, and, you know, and then wait on your own product or you release white spirit and there's some love, you know, I've done a lot of that. Right. Or right. you have more money than God. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. So, but you know, I, you know, I can't give advice to people that I don't know, but if I was, you know, starting out a craft distillery right now, I'd probably pivot and really concentrate on white, white spirits right now until, um, that or think about making, you know, producing some whiskey and keeping it in bulk until you could find the barrels to, you know, barrel it in. But who knows when that's going to be, right? So, right. Um, yeah, I really don't know what the answer is. I think, you know, one of the things that's been talked about too, it's, you know, nobody's organized to do this yet, but, you know, it might be time to start thinking about 
um, changing legislation or the you know the definition of bourbon a little bit to say that the if a, bur a bourbon barrel is completely disassembled, completely refinished and reassembled, you know that that can st still be considered a new cask. Um, right. I mean, if it's refired. Re and yeah, scrape and refire. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You know, and so you know, even even from uh, because you know the numbers just don't match up too. There's so many bourbon barrels that are going to hit the market. And I don't know that scotch industry can absorb all of them. Right. So yeah. Um, yeah. I think that that's something to really consider, you know, as long as the barrels are properly um, disassembled and reassembled, you know, there's already cooperages in the United States doing that. Right. So. Right. Yeah. yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. All right, the last, the, the last yeah. question is always a fun one. So the last question is, Let's talk kids breakfast cereal here. So, you know, the old days of Lucky Charms and Tony the Tiger, all that kind of stuff. What is your favorite of those? And it can't be some sort of uh, shredded fiber adult cereal. What was your favorite kid cereal? You already said it, Lucky Charms. Hands Lucky Charms. <laughs> second to take, come up with that answer. Yeah, Lucky Charms, because you have got to eat all the dried marshmallows up first, you know? Yes. Yeah. So my kids, you know, I was one of those those moms, right. When they're growing up all, you know, all the homemade cookies and no sugar cereal and all that kind of stuff. So my oldest daughter, who's got a food science degree from Purdue, you know, she gets to college, her college rebellion was like eating Cool Whip out of the container and all the mar and by like lucky charms and eating all the marshmallows. Yeah. <laughs> it's what I did when I was a kid. So it's like, oh, well, I guess that's genetic, you know? Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and your sisters would be so mad. It's like you ate all the marshmallows out of the lucky charms. <laughs> yeah. My daughter did the same thing. She 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 liked Lucky Charms too, and she would just eat the marshmallows. I'm like, that's that's like three percent of what's in the box, you know. She'd go through and they all be gone, and then yeah, then we have to eat the regular. Yeah. College rebellion. Even the weird thing is, she was studying food science. And I'm like, you know what all the chemicals are, and she was like, I know. I'm still good. <laughs> they're, just, they're just good. They're just good. All right. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for for joining us. Can you stick around and and uh, you know, keep it? In? That sounds good. We'll we'll bring you back at the end to share your social. Media number, okay. All right, let's hear for Lisa Wicker, gang. Let's hear for Lisa. Hey, -o. all right. What we'll do next, we'll take a quick break, and then when we come back, we're going to be talking to Heather Bean. We'll do that in just a few. Today's show is sponsored by Moonshine University. Moonshine University offers programs to assist individuals in the bourbon industry or simply fans wanting to step up their knowledge. Whether you are looking for in-person learning in the classrooms in Moonshine University or looking for self-study online, there are options to fit your unique needs. Check them out at moonshineuniversity.com. And we are also sponsored by the ABB Networks Distiller Summit in Key West, Florida. The six-day event mm -hmm. features networking opportunities from January 24th through 30th, 2023, when there will be no better place to be in the world but sunny Key West. Get more information on our website at abbnetwork.com. Yes, yes. We had uh, 40 people in Key West this year, and hopefully we'll have even more next year. So. It just and gets bigger and bigger. Lisa, we've talked to you about being there. Uh, any chance we'll see you in Key West next year? We're not getting recorded right now, right? Oh, well, yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting recorded right now. I'm not going to answer that. Okay, okay. She we'll may take that or as a strong be. maybe. <laughs> right. uh, Heather, we're, 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 you're going to be there for sure, right? I, I, I would love to. Believe okay. me, I, I need to get out of my exposed wood. Here. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exposed wood. We got exposed brick. or what? Exposed wood. Colorado. This is Colorado. Exposed wood. Colorado. I have a lot. Yeah. I have exposed brick also, but just not in here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, our next guest is, uh, you know, with an industry filled with chemists, engineers, reform lawyers, owning distilleries. It's safe to say that the bourbon industry is filled with smart individuals, but we may be talking to the smartest here tonight. So please join me in welcoming Ms. Heather Bean. Hey, Heather, how you doing? <laughs> Okay, I, I have a major case of imposter syndrome right now. It's what I have. I just listened to Lisa's pedigree, and uh, <laughs> I got nothing. Oh, no, 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 because our, our, no. our, our mm. first question is going to take you through this, because <laughs> you have such an interesting background in academics. And just start us out. Tell us, how old were you when you started college? Uh, 14. 14, yes, like all of but us. But I, though. you know, I, I, and I didn't drink a drop until I was 28, uh -huh. But but believe me, I, I think I've made up for it since then yeah. with being a craft distiller and such. So so I, I don't know. At this point, I I think I've just managed to uh, you know normalize my uh, <laughs> strangeness. 
and, but, and how uh, and how many degrees do you have? Um, well, troublingly, only uh, mechanical engineering and chemical engineering and chemical <laughs> engineering. Anyway, um, I know people who are so much higher achievers than I was, but I, I was, you know, I needed to go mountain biking and skiing and rock climbing, and I, I don't know, I, I had other problems. Well, <laughs> what's, it, what's it like being a 14 year old taking a class with someone who is at least 18 and you know maybe up to 22 23 24 uh yeah so that's actually strange my my friends were well i i lied about my age for starters so nobody uh -huh. knew how old i was i was you know tall something right. anyway um no one knew how old i was and most of my friends bizarrely were like you know, the non-traditional age students on the other end, they were like, you know, 28, 30, you know, impossibly old to a 14-year-old. Right. But yeah, yeah. For, for whatever reason, I, I seem to gravitate older in the friend sense. So, um, yeah, so I don't know why that didn't Socially, seem you weird. were okay. You didn't say you were real oh, age. No, and, and, that was... Uh, no, I that was that was fabulous to me. Go to college, just start lying about it. Nobody knows. Just fit, <laughs> just fit right in. Just like move on. <laughs> no, yeah. that was that was fantastic for me actually. Because when I was uh, you know earlier in school, people knew who I was, and they tended to, you know, treat me maybe differently for that. And then I could just finally blend in and say nothing's weird here. And, right. and the hilarious thing about that is. Um, you know, later in life, I met some of my old professors, and they said, yeah, we knew there was a 14-year-old in the classes, but we didn't know who it was, oh, and okay. none of them ever guessed it was me. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> they, they, they picked a load of other people, apparently, which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> yes, yeah. So, and I enjoy, you know, talking to you, uh, conversation, and yeah, it's it's so interesting when you're, you know, because you you even keep like a, a different schedule. You're up at late at night. Like if I if I email you, I the response might come at three in the morning. Uh, you know, it, so it, it, and it can go both ways. That right. that could be I got up, or it could be I went to bed. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. So uh, it's, it's just fascinating to me. So uh, I, you know, I'm barely scraping through school and, and uh, you know, and then to hear that, that stuff is just crazy to me and uh, unbelievable. So very, very cool stuff, Heather. Um, so, you know, once you graduate and you got all these engineering degrees and, and that kind of stuff, and how do you decide to get into, you know, distillery? You know, how, how does this come about? So um, I was a, I was a research and development engineer at Hewlett Packard for 15 years, mm -hmm. and uh, this was kind of in the 90s through a huge number of tumultuous periods in tech, and it was in the early 2000s. Outsourcing was huge. My job was a lot less fun than it used to be, and uh, you know, my job went from a lot of sort of interesting engineering work to a lot of telecons with India at you know 2 a.m. or 5 a.m. This may inform my hours to this day, but <laughs> um, yeah, I kind of always say that 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 drove me to drink and being a good engineer. I just decided I needed to support my habit um, in other ways, right. <laughs> so I decided to become a craft distiller. Um, I used to work in Portland, Oregon a lot, and um, inkjet printers of all things, and I got to see some of the early craft distilleries there in the early 2000s, and, you know, I, I got to thinking, heck, I could do that, and I'm having a really bad time right now, <laughs> so, so I kind of quit and took the plunge, which yeah. I can't say is a great idea, but it's been a fun idea. Right. So far, it's, so good. It's worked. Ish. Yeah. Now, <laughs> now uh, you know, I've never been to your place. I will get to it. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, I will get to visit your facility uh, this summer. But uh, you, you moved. Looking forward you, to. Yeah. Yeah. You had uh, what was, I would say, again, if just seeing it in pictures, kind of very industrial feel, very cool mm. looking distillery. But now you've really gone industrial. You moved to a, an old grain elevator, right? Yeah. It's, well, it's. I would almost say it's less industrial. Um, okay. It's it's really cool actually, but um, yeah, the old place was just kind of a big concrete block. Um, it was an old concrete factory, 
actually. Okay. And uh, super industrial, um, turned out to be really industrial. We were just renting that place and just as we were leaving, like the ceiling was falling in. <laughs> Those are not necessarily features you want <laughs> right, in right. your tasting room. <laughs> Um, so, so yeah, we were looking for places to buy because we were sort of confronted with that situation that I, I think lots of people are. It's either you're going to, you know, step up and buy some real estate and commit to it, or it's time to go back and get a job somewhere else. You know, we were kind of confronted with, right. is this a hobby that we tried and we want to keep doing it? Or is this it? And uh, also, in addition to the ceiling falling in, that building had been sold, and uh, new landlords, you know, it's a long, you know, it's, it's a common story. <laughs> so uh, we were able to actually find this grain elevator, which is kind of right on the downtown strip, uh, but kind of, um, it's got good bones, you know, as you say to most fixer-upper houses. Right, right. <laughs> But uh, a kind of an empty shell and kind of has taken a lot of work. But I think we got one of the last good real estate deals in this area. So it's actually been fabulous for us. And yeah. in a way, our tasting room is so much nicer. It has heating and air conditioning, you know, and in the old place, it was just kind of like, well, it's the temperature it is marginally <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> changed by maybe something. But um yeah, so I, I think actually our tasting room is a lot more comfortable than it ever was, and we're working on the distillery. I just got some underfloor heating going in our major production area, and I, I do have to say it is glorious, fabulous. Yeah. I, well, a distillery build-out actually kind of fits into who you are, because you like building stuff, and I'm talking, I'm talking big projects where saws, torches, welding, all that stuff mm -hmm. plays into who you are, so this has to be kind of fun for you, isn't it? This is fun for me, and I, and I have to say, uh, I question myself on literally an hourly basis that I've tried to do so much of this project um, myself and with my, well, obviously with a lot of help from my friends who are mostly also crazy engineers, but I've put more of a priority on just doing this project kind of piece by piece and doing it the way I want it done than I have with let's just get it done and keep running a distillery. So it's been, yeah, a challenging process of figuring out like what's the priority here. So right. anyway, very cool. We're getting there. You're getting there. Uh, well, I, again, I can't wait to see it. So it'll be, it'll be fun. Now there's nobody who watches something called the bourbon talk show on YouTube. And it's just like, eh, I'm just kind of, uh, you know, a casual bourbon fan. We have people who take the time to watch us. They're really into bourbon. They want to know history and everything about it and production and all that kind of stuff. So tell us a little bit about your operation, what sort of still you use and what do you think that the things that are make syntax unique? So, um, man, I, I I'm like at a, crazy break point right here to tell you the truth um mm -hmm. we use all local grain um okay. straight out of northern colorado and i think that's one of the big things that makes us unique we have never sourced alcohol that we did not make um all of our bourbon that's in barrels there's um we're so tiny you know we're we're, we're nothing on the nothing on the scale of what lisa was talking about we're so little so we have about 100 barrels in the basement and that is literally things I all made on the sills I built at our first location. Yeah. Uh, we have just purchased a Holstein still, which is this giant, sexy copper beast that yeah. um, actually used to be in Colorado Gold Distillery, but they, um, they lost their lease during the COVID times. Okay. And I was able to get that still. And I have assembled it and I'm just about to turn it on, maybe even within the week. So um, I will be using completely different equipment and uh, I, 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 hate, I hate to put it so bluntly, but I have no idea what I'm doing right now. Uh, so that'll be fun. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, that's how you, yeah, I, just I, it's I, learning yeah, on the I'm, job. Yeah, yeah. I'm used to it. I, right. <laughs> if I knew what I was doing, I might be bored for a minute <laughs> or not. Um, <laughs> I think I need a vacation. But anyway, uh, so yes, I will be running on all new equipment. And uh, so this, this 
will be interesting. I, I'm I'm sure that my first few batches will not be worthy of <laughs> anything fabulous. But um, of course, I'm looking to keep going with, you know, our, our bourbon has won a whole number of awards and it's very tasty. Very um, tasty. Yeah. I've, mm, having a little. Yeah. And yeah, so, you know, my goal initially is just how can I replicate this on the uh, completely larger, better equipment than Phil's I built yeah. 10 years ago. Hey, you so, heard the earlier interview too. If you get stuck, call Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think so. Like, yeah, it's not for you free. Know, I, so, so yeah, she's not in the consulting anymore, but she will help you out. And, and uh, by the way, if you have to use- think of it's going the other way around. <laughs> Remember I said earlier, sometimes I guess go the other way. Yeah. No, you know, you know what I call myself? The jackass of all trades. And that's completely true. That's great. <laughs> so I don't yeah. really know what I'm doing, but but somehow I'm I'm tenacious. Oh, I'll I'll eventually sort it. Uh, one of the true characters from the industry too, because you always talk about it's lucky you own the company because as such, as the company owner, you are by de facto the HR person. You're lucky you don't have an HR person <laughs> oh, yeah, overseeing no, you. <laughs> no, yeah, that's that, excellent. That would not end well, right? <laughs> okay, when I, when I was in the corporate world, uh -huh. I, I recall my boss once saying that like, like the aisle, the cubicles, the aisle I was in, they called it the pirate ship. <laughs> and they said that was my fault. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, uh, apparently, I swore a lot and encouraged, perhaps. Yeah, you less just created than... an atmosphere. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, and that was apparently me. So anyway. Right. Yeah. There you go. Well, uh, now is a very exciting time for you because it's time for a McNew question. McNew, you're up. What do you got? I feel like we need some sound effects or something on these questions. I know. We need to work on production. For work on that. So McNew but... question. McNew. <laughs> McNew. <laughs> but Heather, you are a person of so many interests, so many talents. If you weren't distilling, what would be the dream job? What would you be doing that's going to keep you this entertained? Oh, dear. Um, let me think about that for a minute. You know, back in the day when, well, when I was like, you know, 20 years younger, I, I would have loved to be like a mountain bike racer or a, you know, ski racer or something. I, I was a total adrenaline junkie. <laughs> and somehow I think grain elevators have gotten my adrenaline junkiness out. <laughs> Um, I did. I did learn to ride a motorcycle like a year ago, so so now I can get my adrenaline junkiness out that way a little bit. <laughs> so, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. So, well, that would I would have gone for something adrenaline based. Probably. Adrenaline based. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. We might have uh, seen you uh, like in the Olympics or something like that. You never know. You could have been. Except I. Except I was a desk jockey engineer. Okay. So well, <laughs> no. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I've always said like a, I should be a Gemini, but I'm not. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, you should be friends with our, our buddy from Colorado, Lenny Eckstein. He's he's big outdoors. So it's all that kind of stuff. I, and... I, I am friends with okay. Lenny Eckstein. Right, that's actually. good. Yeah, now you that you mention it. Yeah. No, we're both kayakers. And, oh, and that's yeah, how yeah. I met him. Yeah, yeah, we're both kayakers. And we have kayaked before together nice. on a few occasions. Yeah, he even does something called yeah squirt boat. I don't even know what that is, but he's talked about it. The squirt boat. Oh yeah, Th those are those little ones that they're, yeah. they're very tiny and they go underwater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So sounds crazy um, to me. Yeah. yeah, they're they're definitely. I'm I'm more like down the river, but yeah, the squirt boats are uh, they're, 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 they're their own thing. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So I was looking around on your uh, website, Heather, and I saw a product I hadn't uh, seen before. So tell me about Wellhead Whiskey. What's what's going on with that? Um, so that's actually kind of a collaboration product. Uh, that's kind of the brainchild of a buddy of mine who is, man, he's a long-term oil landman. You know, okay. the gas and oil industry is just huge here in Eastern Colorado. Um, it's the massive driver of our economy. And uh, anyway, really interesting dude. He was originally like New York City policeman turned oil landman in Colorado and uh, writes children's books. And anyway, he had this idea to do like, you know, something for the, 
you know, sort of the oil industry type thing. That's a more um, affordable whiskey, a little younger, mixes well. And he came up with the artwork and I said, sure. Like, and, and we kind of have a, you know, sort of gentle person's deal to produce it. It's not a strict up contract sort of thing anyway. Um, so it is, it is a fun product. We kind of play around with it a fair bit and it's, it's usually typically a mostly wheat whiskey with a little bit of barley in it, um, maybe a little bit of corn. It's a, it's a lot of blending. It's kind of always a blending exercise. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, the Wellhead whiskey has been great for us, actually, and people are really fond of it. So it's, it's kind of one of our first forays off of our major syntax brand. And yeah. it's, been, it's been good for that. And and he has a bunch of other ideas. I'm I'm trying to remember some of them. There was a uh, roughneck rum. I think he wants to do. Okay. <laughs> so there were there were some other oil field themed things that he was into. But but yeah, the well has been actually really good for us because it gives us, you know, kind of a, a different avenue than our standard syntax brand. So yeah. to try some things out for sure. We're still early enough in the year here so we can talk about plans for this year. So what uh, what's kind of going on for Syntax Spirits in 2022? Um, so the major thing for us is just uh, get production back rolling and normal and um, finish the last bits on our building. To be honest, I, I really thought we'd be at this point a year ago, but then COVID and things and such and whatnot. And I know that's literally everyone's story, but um, yeah, we have we have basically one room in our building left to finish, one major room, and at least we know what we're doing at this point. Uh, it turns out that redoing a 115-year-old drain elevator takes a lot of figuring out how to do it, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and then a lot of hoping that I didn't do the math wrong and nothing fell in through the basement or something, which so far so good. No, <laughs> no, no concrete has ended up in the basement when. <laughs> so anyway, it's been a very interesting couple of years and COVID has definitely set us back. But yeah, this year is just going to be kind of normalizing production again and just kind of getting back to some kind of schedule, which we have not had the luxury of having. Because um, it's been a couple of years now where we're literally just bottling things out of our existing inventory. And we pretty much shut down wholesale sales because of that, because we're not backfilling, because we've been remodeling instead. Um, right. It is a shame we couldn't stay at our old location while we were doing the remodeling, but that just didn't work out. So it's been, um, yeah, we've just been trying to supply our tasting room do limited wholesale sales and we want to you know get back to normal get out of that little hole we've been in so yeah. and i know when it comes to you know a job like yours and, and as well as being a company owner there's nothing that is per se a normal day but you know if we had to kind of take a look at the at that thirty thousand foot level of you know what's a, a what is a kind of a, a normal day for you what would you say is is would, would be how your day goes knowing that and again you sometimes are known to be a bit of a night owl what's what's your day like oh man <laughs> i wish i had a normal day well i guess i would say that in the morning I get up and it's pretty much always sit down at the computer, um, delete about, I don't know, 120 spam emails, see, uh -huh. see what, see what I actually have to pay attention to respond to that if I have to. And if it's a day I'm working out in the building, then hopefully it's get started and, you know, do a job. And with any luck, I have, you know, a buddy to help me out that day. And then, you know, we'll get that job hopefully done although usually you know something goes wrong because inevitably and then usually in the evening it's kind of back to sit at the computer again see if anything urgent has come in on the email or do some books or things like that um i, I i'd like to say that there was any any glamour in this but not not right now right. <laughs> and then sometimes i get to be on talk shows like sure that's a highlight though right that's a, that's a highlight. it 
It is 100% a highlight. It's <laughs> wonderful. I, I get to interact with other people this way. Well, and, and also, um, I have to give major props to my partner, Jeff, who um, has been taking over a lot of the bartending duties. We used to have three bartenders in our um, tasting room slash cocktail bar. And uh, for various reasons, we lost all but one of those during the COVID years, just because, well, one was a nurse and you can figure that we weren't paying the same as traveling True. nurses can get, yeah. right. <laughs> as it turns out. Um, <laughs> So, no, she, she was fabulous. And uh, another guy graduated with his engineering degree. And also, as you can figure, we don't pay as well as, you know, you can get with an engineering degree, uh, which is something I have to think about daily. But anyway, not important. <laughs> um, so, so anyway, and uh, so my partner, Jeff, my business partner, has been doing a lot of the bartending and a lot of managing the bar. So that's been fabulous. And... I occasionally have to do that if he is busy, but um, I always have to like tell people I'm not the real bartender and I'm very sorry. And you'll just have to put up with me um, telling you funny stories because I won't be nearly as great at bartending. (laughs) (laughs) I think you've got good stories. You just got, you just got to get past some of that. And uh, yeah, you've got, you definitely. We we are, we are just the tiny, we're, we're the littlest and the tiniest. And I I don't know, I want to say the scrappiest, but um, we're, we're kind of very little and we've gone the direction, which is kind of do it ourselves and keep it under, you know, well, maybe I'm a control freak, you know, it's like keep it under our control for now and not, not be, not risk everything by trying to take a lot of money on board and things like that. So we'll, yeah. we'll see how that goes, yeah. <laughs> but we're kind of keeping it small and small and working it, getting it bigger. Nice. Well, we're just about three months out now. I, you know, we, uh, me and uh, Bo Cumberland, my filmmaking buddy and partner uh, in that side of the business, we are going to be out in Colorado making a movie called Colorado Whiskey. I think there's such a fantastic scene there. It often gets overlooked. Everything gets, you know, overshadowed by Kentucky. It's uh, everything in bourbon is, is Kentucky, 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 which is great. They deserve it. They make fantastic products. But we also like to be able to tell the stories of, of other things that are going on. So we're going to be telling the story of six Colorado distilleries, yours being one of those. And then ultimately kind of telling also the bigger picture of Colorado whiskey. Why is it such a great place to make whiskey? Why is there this fun and eclectic scene with all these different distillers with different takes on things? And you're part of that. So tell us a little bit from your perspective, you know, what you think of being involved in that project. Um, actually, I love Colorado, and I, this goes back to, I, I think, what Lisa was saying exactly, is that people are just really lovely to work with. Um, you know, people ask me for help. I ask people for help. You know, it, it's just a great um, collective consciousness, and people are just very nice and kind about offering and receiving help. So. I think it's just fabulous that everybody has such a nice collective culture. You know, it's not like what I've witnessed in some, you know, other fields where people are withholding information and they're kind of keeping it, um, you know, keeping things up their sleeves and people have been very, very kind. And I really appreciate just being in that, um, you know, that situation, that culture. And I think Colorado has been, Um, great for that but of course it's probably that way in many other places too but I I do think it's great here and you know we we, at least for me I am in you know Weld County which is actually one of the largest grain growing regions in the country it's like you know second only to counties in California so we do have a, a great sort of natural resource base for making whiskey and I think that's kind of been underappreciated in general. So, right. um, and, and of course, you know, every area has their unique soils, their unique grains, and I think we make some pretty good stuff. So I think that's exciting and it's lesser known. And Colorado is so known for its beer culture. Uh, it has taken a while, but I think people are also catching on that distilling is pretty cool around here too. <laughs> So yeah, I think, I think so. there's just a lot of fun things about being in this area. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm really proud of, uh, you know, this project and I can't wait to film it 
I'm proud of the fact that we're doing it. I think that uh, it's going to give, I think it's going to open bourbon fans eyes to what else is out there. So it's, you know, Kentucky is always going to be number one, but there's room for, for to expand, you know, the experiences and there's a great scene. There's plenty of distilleries you can go visit. And, and I think it's going to be eye opening for people to see what's going on there. So kind of cool. So I don't know if, uh, you know, the audience here knows uh, this, but you and I have known each other for a long time before I ever got it. You know, the, my company, the ABV network was launched in 2016, but before that I was a struggling author, self-published so I could write about whatever I wanted. And I started out writing about what I knew. And that was the grocery business. I was uh, worked for a food broker for many years. And um, I, you know, what, what always fascinated me was how can you have, uh, you know, in the condiment section or the pickles or whatever it is, how can you have, you know, a, a, like a pickle company like Vlasic and all these ones that have all these marketing dollars and all that. And then on the, on the shelf is this little company that, uh, that just makes things local and, and sells it out there. How, how, how can they survive? And, uh, you know, so I used to I write books about, uh, you know, called small brand America, and it would be about these small companies. And I decided to expand out a bit. I did one just on the beer uh, industry on craft uh, beer. And then the first thing I ever did involved in bourbon was in 2014. I decided I was going to write a book because I liked bourbon uh, about craft bourbon distilleries and, uh, and kind of have the same approach, small brand America. How can, you know, small craft distilleries, how can they, they compete? And, and when you've got all the big dollars and marketing and all the things that the, the big heritage brands have, and I reached out to you and, this is starts the friendship that why you got to be in everything that I do. When we were doing a Colorado whiskey movie, you're going to be in it. When we're doing the bourbon talk show, you're going to be on it. So why did you respond to that? I, I wasn't in any known entity. Why, you know, why, why, why would you, why would you say, yeah, I'll be in their book, Steve. I, I don't, this is fascinating to me. I, I, I think we're both scrappy, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I, I thought, I, I, okay. I, you know, I can't help myself. I, I am a like, you know, recreational writer in my spare time. Uh -huh. <laughs> You, you've probably seen my Facebook post, but anyway, right. um, I just, I, I love the idea that you were doing scrappy things and yeah. I was doing scrappy things and, you know, a huge amount of what, you know, motivates me to keep going in this is just, I think it's fun and I am scrappy about it. And I don't care if I'm living like a grad student. I, I mean, the funny thing is that that's just not important to me. Um, what is important to me is doing what I believe in and doing what I want to do. And I, I think I've always seen that in you. So, yeah. so yeah, thank we're definitely, you. We're and I appreciate though, your sure. continued yeah. support. <laughs> Heck yeah. That's, that's the way I am. You know, somebody who would take a chance. I mean, you know, that's what I look back on, you know, these brands, they've got a lot invested in the brands, even the you know, craft stores, everything that they have is invested in these brands and to put it out to an author that they don't even know to write about their company. I think it's pretty cool. And, you know, those people will always be important to me and you and I have stayed friends after this. I can't say I'm friends with everybody that's in the book, but I do, I have maintained some of those friendships uh, throughout the years. People like uh, Christine Riggleman was in that book or uh, my buddy Ryan from 10th mountain uh, distillery. You know, th those are friendships that I've been able to maintain all through this journey and it's been a very cool thing for sure so yeah well and, thank you thank yeah. you very much actually because I, I i think it's fabulous and i i don't know i appreciate just being friends with people with the similar mindset where it's just you know we're going to be scrappy and we're going to make something happen <laughs> yeah yeah it's definitely definitely uh kindred spirits there because yeah it's it is about you know i, I would be a lot safer in the corporate world but when I decided to do this, I don't want to be in the corporate world anymore. I, I matter of fact, I couldn't go back to it at this point, but you know, this is, this is great and it's fun and you know, I'll never make the money I was making as a, uh, you know, in the, in the corporate world, but I don't care. I'm happy now. I've, I'm doing something for myself, which is awesome. So very cool. I, I, I'm with you. I, I periodically think, man, I was working a lot less and paid a lot more. Right. And right. then I think, well, do I want to do that again tomorrow? Oh, yeah. God, no. I'm not even sure I'm suited. I, I think I might be, you know, I, I think I'm spoiled. <laughs> I think right. I'm ruined for it. <laughs> we're too much. We're too, you and I are too much pirate ship to be able to go back to the corporate world. Exactly. It was bad enough. <laughs> It was bad enough before. Now it's right, just, right. Yeah, there's still no going back. We're but, uh, that, past that, the point of return. So yeah, <laughs> the ship has literally sailed. <laughs> yeah. So so the last question is always a goofy one, but okay. uh, I want to ask who is your favorite cartoon character? So if if you had to pick out any cartoon character to watch a show or movie uh, featuring that character, who's your favorite? 
Okay, so the funny thing is, I I'm just not like a giant cartoon person. Okay. But I, I'm I'm going to tell you what other people have compared me to. Okay. Wiley Coyote. Wiley Coyote. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm always like blowing myself up, or uh-huh. but not quite. I still have all my fingers. Right. Like, right. Proof. <laughs> anyway. Um, although I, I periodically threatened that situation. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I, I would say, yeah, Wile E. Coyote has got to be sort of my kind I of love Wile E. Coyote. And you know, the best ones to me aren't the Roadrunner ones. Those are, those are good. But the, the really good ones are when he's with the sheepdog and they're going in, they clock, to, clock in at the same time at work in the morning. And then, then, then their work is he's trying to get the sheep and, and he's stopping them. And I, that just cracks me up the fact that whoever thought of their clocking in is just. It's I, just... I, no, I, I, I just, I do love Wiley Coyote. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and he's always got some clever plan. He's going to, you know, right. this, is, yeah. this is all going to go perfectly. And, <laughs> and then, and then he's, you know, he's falling off a cliff. Never, <laughs> never works out that way for Running him into the wall and it's yeah. like yeah I, I i think i had the keys to this grain elevator for approximately 10 minutes before my buddy and i tried to um you know literally kill each other on a 100 year old man lift by oh. putting two people on it it's it's a man lift not a man right. lift or, <laughs> and, and i was like i was like yeah that's classic right right yeah. <laughs> absolutely so. Well, Heather, thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for being part of the well, Thank, thank, Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for appreciating Teensy, Weenie, and Scrappy. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we'll wrap it up. If Anything you want to share, I'm talking websites, social media, anything like that is good by us, okay? You know, what I'm going to say is... Um, Man, stay tuned in the next uh, few months and uh, watch us on Facebook, Syntax Spirits. Um, Syntax Spirits is our handle on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, pretty much everything. And I look to be actually ma- making a whole new website here at, by the end of this month. And so just big changes in the works now that we have this brand new still and brand new building and it's going to be actually uh, not quite as much of a work in progress. Although I imagine I could spend 10 years on this building, but yeah. um, by the end of this year, it's going to be at least functionally done and we'll be having tours again. And anyway, all the all good things. Cool stuff. Yeah. Looking forward so. to that. All right. And Lisa, I, I look forward to meeting you and thank you so much. Yep. Yep. I, I look forward to seeing you as well. So that's going to be fun. Lisa, how about you? Where can people find you learn more, follow the journey? Um, widowjane.com, obviously, um, on Instagram, myself personally is LB Wicker on Instagram, um, Facebook. Yeah, we're out there. Um, we've got an amazing like social media presence and, um, I don't know all the, all the things I'm supposed to be able to say to you. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. You did good. They'll, they'll find it. It's, it's easy. They're all a lot younger it's than all, I am. It's all right. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. How about you, McNew? Where can people find you? You can find me on Instagram at McNew ABV. All right. For me, I'm an easy guy to find. I'm at Steve Akeley on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. I've got a website, steveakeley.com. No TikTok. You can't find me out there. If you find Steve Akeley on TikTok, that's not me. That's not me. (laughs) (laughs) Check out abvnetwork.com. That's the important website. Everything that we do is out there. We got all kinds of events. We've got a cool shop. We've got uh, all, you know, previous podcasts. We've got over 3000 podcasts you can listen to. So if you're downloading or you're going to go kayaking, uh, check us out to download some shows. It's all out there at abvnetwork.com. McNew, anything else to say before we get out of here? I'd like to remind the audience to please hit that subscribe button on Bourbon Sasquatch on YouTube where all of our shows will be posted. And when you're watching an episode, please give us a thumbs up, leave some comments and share it. It helps new people find the show, which is very important to us. And next week we will be chatting with Phil Collin of Phil Talks Whiskey and Jade Peterson of Kentucky Artisan Distillery. Uh, That'll be fun. Looking forward to that. One last round of applause for our guests, Heather and Lisa. Thanks guys. It was great. Really appreciate it. Lots of fun. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye. 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 Thank you.